ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by de facto shaving oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to episode 72 of That Great Business Show, posting on the 28th of January, 2022. I am Conal O'Moran. Episode 72 of a weekly podcast means that you could now binge and listen to us non-stop for three days, and that's music to our business ears. Please, please like and share us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Thanks to the many, many of you who have already done so and continue to do so. It's commercial gold for us. So this is the What Are You Worth episode. You've seen the newspaper supplements telling you how much homes are worth. Because we do business differently, we decided to tell you what your job is worth. Like the software sales reps under 30 years old earning, wait for it, €250,000 plus and locum pharmacists charging three times their usual hourly rate, and recruiters being offered twice their usual basic salary to move in-house. Stay tuned, as they say. Also, a Fiat Punto was once Ireland's best-selling car, then it all went pear-shaped. Fiat has now merged with Peugeot, Citroën, Opel and Jeep to form the vast Stellantis car-making supergroup and they're fighting back. We have their prize fighter in studio. And sea swimming was a thing during lockdown. That led to the rise and rise of dry robes. To bring Today we bring you Orca the Irish for dry robes. All of these great insights, including your guide to leveraging more pay, is brought to you thanks of our sponsor, De Facto Shaving Solution. Man or woman, it's the best anyone can get. Buy it right now on DeFactoShave.com. That great business show. Money is something that feels intensely personal, especially as it's too often wrapped up into how we probably feel about our own self-worth. Few people are open to friends, not even to their families, about how much they earn. But in Finland, any stranger can find out. Every year on November the 1st, it's dubbed National Jealousy Day. Every Finnish citizen's taxable income is revealed and is searchable by anyone. The annual orgy of financial voyeurism remains an important national event in Finland, according to one article I was reading. Today on That Great Business Show, we instigate Ireland's National Jealousy Day because we're going to reveal as much about salaries as we can in the next half hour. And who better to ask about salaries than Sigmar Recruitment? According to their website, they employ 150 industry experts. They have offices in Dublin, Cork, Galway, Sloan, Tralee. They've won 50 plus awards for excellence and that kind of thing, which all means they're good, they're big, they're knowledgeable, and most importantly, they're here. Rossa Mullally, Director with Sigma Recruitment, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thanks for having me, Connell. Rossa, how much do you earn? <laughs> Not enough. Um, <laughs> if, it's talk- if we're talking about National um, Jealousy Day, I get jealous often. I get jealous every day seeing the salaries out there. So I have a strange relationship with a lot of the people that I meet and the fact that I have to ask them quite bluntly and quite early in the, you know, quite early in the foreplay, for want of a better word, how much do you earn to get uh, to get straight down to it? And uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear the different uh, the different levels across the different industries. It's a, it's a strange question uh, to ask and it's a strange question to know how to ask and when how to ask it and know when to believe it. Um, and I'll come back to it in a second. Well, because, but tell me, how do you ask it? I mean, it's just a straight question. What's straight? John, Mary, how much do you earn? Well, you wouldn't say that. You know, you, you would ask, first of all, depending on what they're in, it's like how much is their basic salary, of course. You know, so you, you always want to, there's certain numbers out there that get inflated or deflated depending on what you're talking about, you know. So when I was in, when I was in school, it was like I, had, I got 13 Easter eggs, you know, back in the 80s. Now, probably kids these days do get 13 Easter eggs, but I was always wondering, I was like, I only got two. Like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> then you realize when you get older that they're not getting 13 Easter eggs. So when you're talking to people, uh, when you're asking about the basic salary, it is, you, you have to gain their trust first. You have to, they have to understand that you're not, it's not the first question we'd ask them, you know, um, and then we'd, 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 we'd phrase it in a way once we feel that we've gotten their buy-in, we've, once we've gotten their trust. And then we'll, we'll break it down into kind of all the earnings that they could be possibly including. Um, because often when you ask somebody, you know, what they earn, they might say, just for simple maths because uh, don't do it don't do it live on the radio I, I'm on a I make 100k and it's like okay but I know the industry so I know you're not on 100k in my head so I'll ask well you know do you have a car allowance uh, you know uh, factored in there or a pension or this or that and we'll 
we'll we'll eventually get down to the the real. So we're real all meat big fat fits. liars, is that it? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Everybody inflates. Everybody tends to inflate the figure, and I certainly question your friends. And one of the things you said, because as you raced in here, you said you are super, super, super busy in the industry. Everybody, we know this from the podcast every week, people are saying we cannot get talent. We cannot get people to work. We cannot, cannot. And there is this hype about uh, um, uh, wages and salaries going through the roof. True or not? True to an extent. Like like anything that there, it's true, but it's not as true as the as some of the uh, some of the horror stories or some of the uh, more uh, salacious stories would lead you to believe. We love salacious. Like I have examples of people who were maybe in their mid to late twenties, and I know for a fact that they're earning close to half a million. Ah, you know, close to half a million. Doing what? Usually, Drug dealing. usually tech, usually tech, usually software. Half. Half a million. million. And yeah, what half a million. Oh, they could be under 30. There's a lad in there called Mark McCarthy who's listened to this, and I think he's going to just walk straight out and retrain. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, it's certainly a sector that's worth getting into. Um, there are other people half that... Half a million? Half a million, yeah. And how, I, but how long would that last? Depends on the company that they're in. Wow. You know? In Ireland? In Ireland, yeah. Wow. Okay. Usually U.S. tech companies, and okay. they're usually in a sales, uh, they're usually in a sales uh, role. Um, sales people make more than anybody. Like it is people, I don't really like sales. I don't want to get into sales. If you like money, definitely get into sales. You'll, you'll, you'll earn an awful lot of money if you are lucky. But like everything, they're the outliers. Like I could say podcasting is fairly lucrative. You know, Joe Rogan makes a decent living out of podcasting. You could say that, all right, and he makes a big fat living out of it. It don't happen in Ireland, I can tell you. A hundred percent. So there's outliers in all of them. Um, it is true that we've been busier than we've ever been. I'm in, I'm in recruitment 16 years. I'm in Sigmar 16 years. Um, it's funny, I was explaining to my dad what I do. And he said, what do you, what do you mean? You, 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 you know, I, I help people change jobs. And he had the same job. He, 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 he worked in the printing industry and, and, and retired in the printing industry in the same company. Um, and he said, people change jobs these days. And I said, yeah, they change jobs all the time. And he said, well, you don't. And I was like, that, that's not the point, you know. But <laughs> other people change jobs quite, quite a lot. And that's where, that's where we get into it. And more people are changing jobs than ever before. And more companies are looking for people to hire than ever before. Um, it is. It is probably. Um, it is almost certainly going to last for about six months. This level of 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 uh, activity in the market. I'm 16 years in the company. I've never, and it's not even close. I've never seen it busier. The IT team. I was talking to the uh, the divisional manager, a guy called Owen, who who runs our IT uh, division in, in That's Sigmar IT recruitment now. Yep. Yeah, yep. in Sigmar recruitment. I was talking to Owen today, and they have more jobs being called in by companies so far in January than they had in all of 2021. Now, the IT industry in the tech sector wasn't really hit by COVID as much as other sectors. So it's not a kind of a, a, you know, a, a false figure in any sort of way. It's a bit like fluid dynamics, though, Connell. And we all know what that is. You learn about it when you're, when you're five out the back, when you have the, your, ha- your thumb over the garden hose, and then suddenly you release it and the water goes squirting out. So we have two years of attri- normal attrition. People leave their jobs, people get fed up, they want to move on, and there's a, there's, a, there's a standard level of attrition or a usual level of attrition in people in the, in the marketplace. Everybody stopped during COVID because everybody was afraid that they might lose their job if they were lucky enough to have it. Nobody was moving. At the same time, a lot of companies stopped hiring because the, of the uncertainty in the market or maybe they couldn't get people to travel. And this has caused, there's, there's a couple of different factors involved in it as well. But all of a sudden, you've got now all that pent up Attrition, all that those that pent up kind of you know a desire to leave and desire to move on, coupled with all of these, all of this two years of hiring that was going to happen anyway, all of a sudden we scramble to make to make the hires right now. So, like this is where we're seeing people who are on ninety thousand who are changing jobs, looking for a hundred thousand, which is a ten k increase. Course that's being, ten, but that's ten on nine, which is not going to be a massive increase. It's not the big, big, big jump. No, but getting offered maybe one hundred and ten because the company knows that they have to maybe go above and beyond, and okay. then them turning, handing in their notice, and being offered maybe one hundred and forty to stay. So okay. there's somebody who's gone from 90 to, you know, maybe 140 by, by not even leaving their jobs in some cases. And is this, are these the, your, again, back to your outlier word, is there, are these outliers or is this happening a lot? It, it, those sort of figures would be outliers, but it is true to say that pretty much all sections of, uh, of, 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 of the, uh, all, all sections of the workforce are, are the salaries are increasing. That, that's that, but the, the salary is increasing probably more like the, the actual rate is between five and 15%. Um, in in reality, so there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of hype out there. There are great stories. There are stories that will shock you know uh, 
potential employers. But the reality is, it, it is more. It is. It, it, it's. It's. It's more reasonable. It's probably more in line in, with inflation, and it's not. It's certainly not going to be sustainable with the, some of the levels that we're seeing. Now we want to know what the neighbours are earning. So let's go through some of the sectors. And just because you sent these through to me, I'm looking at accountancy. A st- an accountant starting out is on. Starting out, they used to be on about forty, but now they're off. They're, some of them are looking for fifty or fifty-five, possibly even sixty. And that's post qualification. Okay, yeah. and that's uh, so that's that's a bit of a jump, isn't it? But not everybody can get it, and this is this is the this is the issue. This this I, I, the, the title for the podcast should be "What do you think you're worth?" Um, <laughs> for the moment, because an awful lot of people we think we're worth a lot. Uh, of money. Yeah, everybody thinks that they're 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 worth more than they are, and I kind of. I like to think about it as like the California gold rush. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people made a lot of money, but the vast majority of people didn't make as much money as certainly as they hoped that they would have, you know. Um, there is an expectation sometimes people out there where they go, oh, I'm on 40 and I want 60, I want 60,000. And the reality is for most of them, it's not going to happen. You know, like there's this. But I thought with accountants and accountancy that uh, the big Facebooks, the Googles and all the rest of them were just hoovering those people up because they were useful in other uh, outside of the straightforward auditing, etc. type of business. It, it depends on what they're looking for. It, it, those companies do hire across a broad spectrum of people, but they usually typically they're they usually p- typically do spe- go back to the specialized function. You know, so there, there will be people like engineers and accountants are always great people to hire because they're smart. They, they've studied a hard science, they can figure out things and uh, they can get things done. So they'd always be, they, they always have been in demand from all sorts of companies. The bigger companies, the bigger tech companies, yeah, they can offer sometimes salaries to people, but again, can they attract people to come to because of, is there, is it like it does, having a name and having a brand is one thing, but having the work that's going to be fulfilling to those people is another thing. So money won't, you can't, you can't buy. You can buy talent to a to a degree, but it doesn't solve every every problem. When you're standing at the bar trying to impress people, it's much more impressive to say, "Oh yeah, I'm working with Google," than it is that I'm working with Jackson Accountants or whatever. I hope there's no Jackson Accountants out there. <laughs> That's subjective, and I have to be careful uh, about companies that I talk uh, talk about. Yeah. Um, it depends on how people. It really, it comes down to this: if you like the people you work with, you like your job. You could be working in the biggest branded company and hate your job because they don't provide a great uh, culture or there's the, the job isn't meaningful for you. And often an awful lot of the, 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 sa- the motivations when people come to me are usually the same thing. They're not challenging their work or they don't, like, they don't like something about the culture of their work. They're the main drivers and that can happen in any organization. So having the brand or having, having some of the benefits that these companies have when you walk in, they're like a five-star hotel and they're great, but they're temporary and they won't solve fundamental problems of actually enjoying your work. Now, we're having the chat, but we need to have the figures. So I'm going to allow you, because I couldn't possibly imagine that you're going to have all of this in your head. Lash through various big sectors, the sectors that you know that one are big, as in wide, and a lot of people working there. And secondly, the hot ones, please. So like in in IT is probably the biggest and the hottest sector. And the reason is we don't have enough people in IT in Ireland. We don't have enough schools teaching it. Um, You know, we're mandatory teaching some subjects um, and they're, 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 they're kind of... Careful, don't go to go again. Yeah, well, would, no, no, no. But like say, you know, you're, you're mandatory having to study some subjects that would have questionable influence later on in life when IT should be arguably on the curriculum for some for some schools, especially especially the earlier you get into it, the better. We don't have enough people here and because of remote working, we... Uh, we're losing. We're, we're, we're losing. We're losing potential. Um, we're losing more potential candidates to other countries. Are you seeing that now? Because I, this is a thing that I keep imagining and I keep talking about is that we people must have walked off the pitch, uh, non-Irish, come back home to Poland or Estonia, wherever they want to go, and we are losing their talent. A hundred percent. Yeah. Would you see a lot of that? Yeah. Like, it, it, there's not enough IT developers in Ireland. There's not enough people in the IT sector in Ireland, and most of the people that we end up recruiting are from Eastern Europe, where they've done a brilliant job, like Czech Republic, Slovak. Poland, they have excellent, really, really talented software developers, which means there's a shortage of software develop, de- developers here. So supply and demand, you're talking a senior software developers, maybe 100 to, 100, 100 to 120K. And they're, they're the midpoints. They're not the outliers. They're, they're more like the midpoints. My problem about all of the, when you start rattling through these uh, job titles, I've no idea what they do. <laughs> you know, I literally do not know, do they go around with a screwdriver or whatever? I have no idea. 
Sad. Uh, yeah, it's and it is, and I, 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 I wouldn't give you be able to give you much information on some what some software developers do, except that they develop software, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, app development, app testing, usually uh, these sort of things, API, and you know, your your, your interface. Well, I can throw those word, words out, but it doesn't still doesn't mean. So, but tell us again about their salaries and how much are they going up. Um, they'd probably be going up. Outliers again. Excite. One of the examples I gave earlier was was it was like nearly was nearly fifty percent, but probably more like you know between ten and ten twenty ten and twenty percent for in in the software sector. But it's oh that that has always the the salaries have all have always been high. You've seen probably greater jumps in early areas such as qu- um, quantity surveyors. So with quantity surveyors, it is nearly name your own price. It's it's it's. Is it- yeah, it, it, they can, is that post the the, the the collapse of the building industry, or that they all ran away? They all ran away, and then they stopped. It stopped becoming a a a I suppose an attractive course to do. Like there was no, there was like the, there was there was property uh, everywhere. Nobody was building. Nobody was going into it. So of course now that we've had another another property boom, another construction boom, we don't have enough. Uh, and that will continue surveys. for quite some years yeah, for anybody listening. Absolutely, and it's probably a long term a long term course or a long term. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah to, to to do in that senior. So what are they on the QSs? QS is at least 70,000. Is that post-college, directly post-college, or that's a couple of years under your belt? You did probably need a little bit of PQE, post-qualification experience there, but if you, you know, two or three years and you're at least on 70K. You po- qu- newly qualified would be more, maybe like 50, 55,000, yeah. but walking straight into a job where you're earning 50 or 55,000 isn't, uh, that's not bad. certainly didn't happen in my day. So, yeah. <laughs> not here either. So another one, um, choose whichever, I don't mind. Uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about say the pharmacist which was an interesting yeah. one that that was COVID delivered that was kind of COVID uh, that was a response to COVID because you couldn't have as many pharmacists in the shop you had to uh, you, yeah there was only one pharmacist allowed in the shop at the same time you have to have a qualified pharmacist in the shop at the, the shop in the pharmacy at the same time and all the time and uh, a lot of pharmacists then would say they deselected at the start of COVID because they didn't necessarily want to be exposed to COVID as well. So it, it really kind of threw the market into flux. So you were, you were seeing, you, that's where you were seeing maybe people um, being able to command three, sometimes four times their own salary. Whoa. Yeah. That's a lot. It is, yeah. That will not, I mean, obviously it can't last because COVID hopefully is over. So is it back to normal again now? Uh, yeah, you'd see a lot of the people elected, they, they left kind of your your permanent pharmacist job and they went as locums um, and now they've probably started to revert back to uh, to permanent pharmacist shop. But locums will always earn more money because this job uncertainty, you have to be able to move around and you have to work when everybody else doesn't want to work. So there is that element too. So there is a premium attached to working as a locum like, like that. Um Recruitment, I can talk about that because that is an area that is in, in high demand, obviously. I believe you work in it as well. I, I work in it, yeah. Um, Has anybody tried to headhunt you? No, see, surprisingly. See, see what I've done there? You see, I know, yeah, but surprisingly not. Everybody I work with, yes, but not me. So I don't know whether I have, uh, they're put off by my, you know, kind of potato head or something like that, you know what I mean? But not, not really, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. But, um, they're in high, really high demand. Uh, it, there's no better time to be a recruitment consultant. Most companies are, crying out for people, but more and more uh, companies are then crying out for recruiters to join their firm. So this is an area where we'd have direct experience of people doubling and even even maybe doing uh, two, two and a half times their basic salary to move in, in-house. Days. I have never worked out what does a recruiter need to have studied or what qualifications does there a recruiter need? None, technically, right? So, when, but there is an apprenticeship program and it's the second apprenticeship, pro, professional apprenticeship program we've had in this country. Insurance was the first and we're kind of following the lines of the financial services industry where you didn't have to have any qualifications. Um, actually, I used to work in insurance, would you believe, uh, before I got into recruitment. But you, you started studying for your QFA exams or whatever the equivalent is now. Now, um, there is, we do have the National Recruitment Federation. You do have to be, like, it is, it is, it is, wise to be credited with it. it you, you don't legally have to be a member of it or you don't have to be qualified by it but technically you could tar- start up a recruitment company yourself tomorrow um, but we do have there is the first apprenticeship course uh, course run by the uh, National College of Ireland where um, where students, uh, school leavers can you know learn as they earn as they learn as they say and they can uh, 
study and uh, and learn and then become fully qualified. School at the leavers, end of happy years. days. Yeah. You hear that, parents? Jeez, get on to it, quick. But of course, again, actually, we need 176,000 new jobs, or we will be looking for 176,000 jobs, I think, according to Good Money Stockbrokers, over the next two years. So I don't know where we're going to get those people, but recruitment looks like a hot area for the next couple of years. For the next couple of years, yeah. like everything, it's a bit, it, it can be cyclical. Um, I've seen, I've yeah. seen the ups and the downs, um, but ultimately, it doesn't really change. Good people have always been hard to find always been hard to find. Um, I, when I'm presenting to companies about talent and, and how to find people, I always show them um, a, you know, your, your, the, your Where's Wally or Where's Waldo uh, picture, depending on where you are in the world. And they always say, yeah, that's, that's what it's like to find, uh, to find talent. And that it's true to an extent, but what they forget though is that's what candidates, that's what job seekers now see when they look at the marketplace because there's so many people out there. So, Companies need to up their game and and and, and have, have a different message to really try and compete and attract for the talent when they're when they're trying to head, when they're trying to hire them. Marketing is a hot area. It is a very hot area from in regards to that a lot of people want to get into it. It isn't the most lucrative area to join though, which is great for the marketing companies so they don't have to pay ridiculous salaries. All the salaries that I've mentioned there are not necessarily what people are worth, it's just what they're able to command given the supply and demand of the sector. So with marketing, everybody wants to join marketing. And, uh, you know, it's it's one of those jobs where I think that it, it changes over time. When I when I first got into recruitment, it was medical sales reps. You know, everybody wanted to be a medical sales rep. I, I, yeah, yeah. Maybe after watching Dope Sick, they don't want to be Do you know the one, Of all of the things I could probably think of, that would not be very high up on the list. You know, 10, 15 years ago, that's the one that everybody wanted to be in. Okay. Um, now it's digital, like it is digital marketing. And mm. we say digital marketing, it's all marketing. Everything's yeah. digital now, you know. Yeah. Um, but there is a huge supply of candidates. It's a huge supply of courses. There's a lot of online courses you can do. And there's a lot of, there's an oversupply of people wanting wanting to get into marketing. Again, like some of these roles, I think it's, you know, if we were in marketing, they'd imagine us sitting around on bean bags, drinking coffee, coming up with great ideas and having the life of Riley. But like any job, it's really hard work. Um, you have to be talented in it and you're also competing against an awful lot of other people who also want to be marketeers as well, which means that, uh, you know, the salaries aren't aren't going to be as high. So you wouldn't see the the crazy numbers that we've seen in other sectors. So go back to your list and tell me some more crazy numbers or crazy sectors. Um, other crazy well, fact, say, what's your own area of recruitment uh, sales tech sales okay well talk to me about tech sales that's the one that you mentioned at uh, 250,000 oh wow like, in software sales and which is the areas that I, I, I focus on I usually work with companies that are ramping up or expanding into Europe Ireland's a great place to do business we, we're English speaking they come over here we're, we're quite we're quite aligned, aligned with their culture compared to, say, some other European um, countries. And now we don't have another year, uh, uh, you know, um, we don't have the UK to compete with anymore, which is great if they're uh, planning to expand into Europe. Um, those companies will come in and they typically hire huge volumes of people to generate leads for their sales staff and then sell. Like if they're over here, they're selling. That's what they're doing. And then they'll, they'll hire all the other support functions. Um, some of them are fantastic companies. Um, they've created apps that you'd use every day that you you couldn't you couldn't you couldn't you couldn't figure uh, how you, how you could survive without them. Like, um, when's the last time you have to ask anybody for directions? You know, thanks yeah. to thanks to Google Maps or uh, these things. But um, these companies then they're they're they've got a lot of money to expand. They really kind of changed the game in regards to how employees should be treated. They brought in benefits like 20 years ago a benefit was your was you know it was was it was a pension maybe a, a life insurance policy that was it maybe a company car if you had to travel these are the guys who brought in you know your your pizzas on a fridays your free bars your swimming pools your nail bars all all of this dry stuff. cleaning everything yeah. yeah dry cleaning babysitting allowance yeah. yeah babysitting allowance these things um so if you if you can if you join the right company um and if you, if the company had the right trajectory the right kind of growth you could um, you join in, a, you know, you're, you're entering into a fairly, a fairly uh, greenfield marketplace. You're not, if you're not a me too kind of, if you're a unique app and a lot of companies see the need for it, you could, you could, you could make an awful lot of money selling software. Now there's other companies then that you kind of struggle to find out what it's, yeah, it's like, I, I, I get, I get that what that app does, but do we not already? It's it, you, you question what the hell it does, but some you should be it. advising the venture capitalists because you now you're thinking the way they should be uh, thinking is. I mean, it's a great idea, but nobody's going to use it. 
Well, there's definitely a lot of that. There's some of those companies going around where I always kind of think that if it takes more than 15 seconds to explain it, then then, then what does it really do? And sometimes it doesn't really do anything except get sold. Yeah. Um, and what I mean by that is the company gets sold. The VC <laughs> pump it in, say, hire, hire loads of people, hire 200 people, and then we'll sell it and we'll say that it has... 500 staff and so what are you up. telling people to get into software sales? If you want to make money at the moment, that's where I'd go into. Um, what's booming back now as well is B- general B2B sales. So like office uh, office supply sales, that's again boomed. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's going back up. There's a huge demand in it. Wait a second now, we were talking about digital a few minutes ago. Like, does anybody go B2B to, uh, for office supplies or do you not just click on whatever um, uh, store and just click and collect or click and deliver? Yeah, that that is an option, but it depends what you're buying, and it depends what what your setup is, you know. And it's not say maybe what's it, it doesn't lend itself maybe to, to, to some products that you're going to buy, and you need you need to see it, you maybe need to feel it, you need to sit on it, whatever whatever it is. And so yeah, we're seeing a, a big a big demand in 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 these areas. That's very interesting, and I don't even know are there that many companies in Ireland doing that kind of work. I know by say companies like Bizquip and all, but uh, there's yeah. there's there's quite a lot of them. Are yeah. There? yeah, yeah, okay. So there's, like every sector is really taken off. In sales, like if you think about it, every, if we look at everything here, it was sold. Absolutely everything, whether it's the, the, the soundproof window there or the microphones or the carpet, somebody put it in as well, somebody had to fit and fit it. So if you kind of take a look around, no, nothing gets there by accident. It's all sold. It all had to be delivered there as well. So it's... it's um. We're going to run out of time, so I'm going to ask you for one or two just a weird, obscure things that you've come across to say... Either keep away from that or absolutely keep an eye on that area there. Either sector, job, whatever. Anything that's, you've got a young uh, child, I think, and uh, like, what are you saying? It's a she, I think. Is uh, What is she thinking of doing? I know she's very young. I've, I've, I've two, actually. Um, Sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, Aideen, I, I think, is she's very artistic. I'd love for her to get into something creative. And I would generally give this advice to, to all young people. Do something that you love you'll enjoy it more. Do something that you love and if you can make some money out of it, you will have a much more fulfilling career than doing making a lot of money and doing something that you hate. Um, the, the, I don't, I'm not too sure what Killian uh, wants to do. He, I think yeah, he needs a bit more figuring out there. Um, I These would are have, very young children, I think, are they? He, he, Aideen is uh, eight and Killian is, um, Killian is uh, 15. So okay, he's, okay, he's getting, he's a little he, bit older. Yeah, okay. He needs to start <laughs> having a proper think about it soon. Um, you stay away from maybe print journalism. I don't think there's much of a future in that. But apart from, <laughs> not, yeah. <laughs> but apart from that, crying, I'd say, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's. But apart from that, it's uh, most, most, most areas are 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 are, are taken off. And again, there'll be jobs that are. The, 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 I guarantee, I probably won't even understand or know if the word that my kids are, you know, for the title for the job that they're working for. Um, the the law have completely changed. You know, when you're in the pub or driving down the street or whatever what you do, and you look at a guy and you say uh, he's, you find out that he's in, I don't know, uh, mergers and acquisitions. Can you just look at him and say, I know what you're earning? I'd have an idea. Yeah, yeah, I'd have it's an idea. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? It it's, is. Yeah. yeah, it's a different view on a person. Yeah, but I suppose uh, I, I, but you get used to it and you get desensitized to it as well. So it's a bit like maybe. I don't know, a surgeon, you know, going, oh, I've seen, I've seen the insides of somebody that I operated on. And yeah, that's pretty crazy, but like, it's just part of the job, you know? Yeah. Okay. Now, you know, the last, analogy. the last question we ask all of our guests is who would you, Russell Mullally, hire in a heartbeat? Yeah, I almost forgot about this and then I was thinking about it on the way Jeez, in. I told everybody about it. <laughs> no, I did. I, I now put it at the very top of the email because yeah. everybody forgets. Rick Stein. Now, there's an interesting guy. I love him. Yeah. Why do you love him? I, I just want, I think he, like, he seems like a very charismatic person, right? So, uh, and I really like his just, I just, it, it kind of feels like you're hanging around with him while you're on the show and I'd, I'd love to actually meet him. But why, why would I hire him? Like he started off as a nightclub owner. He then saw the opportunity and quickly moved into becoming like a chef and then he suddenly changed his life again. So he's very agile. Um, he obviously has a good business sense on him, so he knows how to kind of he knows how to how to make money. How, he he knows how businesses run. He's he's he seems quite charismatic. And last but not least, he'd be able to you know you know cook some really nice lunches in the canteen if all else fails. So if for anybody who doesn't know Rick Stein, and you should, he's got a fantastically gorgeous series about Cornwall on BBC uh, because Cornwall is where he lives. He's not from there. He's from Norfolk, I think. Yeah, but he is fantastic, and as you say, successful. My God, 
he, I, I looked him up to see exactly how successful. You know your salary survey? Well, he's at the very top of it, I can tell you. I, I have a funny feeling I wouldn't be able to afford him. <laughs> well, uh, he seems like a nice guy, as you say. So, Rick Stein, I think you're hired for Sigmar, or maybe as a personal chef to Rossa Mullally. Either or, whichever one he's into. Rossa, thanks so much. Uh, there is, I mean, you know, there's about 1,000, 10,000 types of jobs we could cover, but I think we get the impression that there is huge demand out there. And if you want to hire people, Sigmar Recruitment is a good place to go, isn't that right? You better Ab- shout out. Absolutely. You know, uh, the other thing is that like all recruitment agencies, but Sigmar is especially, we have a fantastic salary survey, so you can go and look it up. And the the, sal- the salary guides there are up to date and our new salaries will be out. If they're not out already, they'll be out very, very soon. Great. Rossa Malali, Director of Sigmar Recruitment, thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Viscosity. When you shave, you want the highest viscosity because it helps the blade run smoother. De facto, the world's best shaving oil has incredible viscosity. That's why De facto leaves your face, underarms or legs nick-free. Higher viscosity makes blades last longer. De facto is the best for your skin and your pocket. DeFactoShave.com Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Subscribe today to That Great Business Show on your favourite podcast platform, including Apple and Spotify. Ahead of my next item, I was looking up to see what were some of the greatest business comebacks of all time. The top 20 list I was looking at had Apple in first place when Steve Jobs came back and started to rebuild what is now the world's most valuable company. But interestingly, four of the comeback kids on this US list were motor manufacturers General Motors or GM, Ford, Chrysler and Tesla. In Ireland, once upon a time, Fiat had the best-selling model in the country – And then things went south. Now the family-owned Gowan Group has taken ownership of the Honda, Fiat, Alfa Romeo and Jeep franchises. And we'll find out in a minute why they're now known as the Stellantis Group. Because joining me now is the man, newly charged to, to sell all of these cars, John Saunders. Welcome to That Great Business Show. Good afternoon, Connell. How are you? You sound like a man who's about to be shot. <laughs> Is the job that hard? <laughs> it certainly has some uh, some high mountains in front of us and uh, uh, to traverse. But look, it's exciting. It's engaging. Uh, we have a fantastic team back at base in City West. And uh, we've been working on the project for over two years now um, to make sure the conditions were correct. Uh, and uh, everybody inside now is hugely excited. These are phenomenal brands, huge heritage, huge recognition. And our job now is to translate that into good market, uh, good market share, uh, and build a sustainable business. Where we're, the entire Gown Group is all built on good, sustainable business. No pressure, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you sell a car? I know it's a stupid question, a silly question, a basic question, but if you're selling a car, be it a Fiat or an Alfa Romeo, and Kia or Hyundai are selling a car, what differentiates you from them? Yeah, it's it's. I suppose it's what it attracts most of us to the motor industry in the first place, and and keeps most of us in there through the uh, through the very difficult times. But ultimately, um, purchasing a car from a customer's point of view, the the it, it's hard to quantify, but you can't get past passion. And um, I think the challenge we have now is we transition from traditional power based passion. You know, I wanted a car with a bigger engine, and I wanted the car that won such and such a race or, or, or featured in motorsport. It's, it's the technology is new. The technology is, uh, it's traditional car buyers maybe struggle to recognize the, tra- the, the technology, whereas younger incoming car buyers, they have a completely different approach to car purchasing but they recognize the technology much more so. So so that's our challenge really is to is to traverse the gap between traditional as we call them ice engines, internal combustion engines into new low emitting hybrid and electric vehicles. Now I love my cars. So when I was a boy, I used to love even the rasp of an engine. I could tell you with my eyes closed what any car anywhere was, oh that's a such and such and it's a blah blah blah. However, now and you're talking to me now about how you sell a car the technology is more or less the same. Bigger and bigger batteries 
and let it go, pal. Mm. Yeah, and and again, it's the crux really of the Stellantis project. So Stellantis uh, is Stellantis is just coming up to a year old. It's the merger between what was the PSA group of companies, Peugeot, Citroen, uh, and then they bought GM in Europe here. So they bought Opel and Vauxhall, and then they merged twelve months ago with the FCA group of companies, which was headed up by the Agnelli family. So that's Fiat, Alfa Romeo, Chrysler in the states, uh, and the Jeep brand. So the the the, the Motor manufacturing has changed so much now and the pressures, particularly in Europe, to meet uh, emissions regulations um, are forcing motor manufacturers to develop new technologies uh, around EV and batteries, but they can only do it with economies of scale because raw materials are extremely expensive. So the Stellantis piece allows each of those individual brands access to common raw technology, so common platforms, um, in Stellantis is about 14 brands in total. So brands we mightn't see here in Ireland like Lancia and so on. Um, Dodge and Ram and Stealth. Again, it? No, it's only available in left-hand drive. So again, these small niche brands. But it used to be here. It used to be here, yeah. But used not, to love the rust with that yeah, engine. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's again, the passion lives. It's, you don't have to scratch too deep uh, with people of <laughs> a not too old age. <laughs> to, to find that bit of passion, yeah. But... Yeah. What you're telling me now is that they're all going to be the same box with a different badge. No, they'll, they'll all be the same platform. And then this is the really interesting piece. You take a brand like Alfa Romeo. So Alfa, Mare- Alfa Romeo will be positioned uh, uh, performance premium. So that, that will be their position within the suite of brands. So what does that mean? It may take the raw material from a base platform, but it will then apply its steering dynamics, its suspension dynamics, its aerodynamics, uh, its, its raw aerodynamics, and then its styling and then it will appeal to a customer at a different level. Traditionally, Alfa Romeo was built on the original Boxer engine and people knew that different technology from a straight inline four or V6 or V8 and all those traditional uh, internal combustion engine configurations. Now, absolutely, it's, it's about... It's an ever-ready battery. <laughs> it's a very big ever-ready battery. Um, but the, the application of, of drive motors, one per axle, one per wheel, one per corner, whatever that may be, it, there's still great scope within that for a brand to stamp its own identity on it. I'm going to give you two or three minutes of your own on this because what you really are here to do is to sell me the electric Fiat 500 or the Fiat 500 electric. How, what's its correct name? It's the Fiat 500 electric, yeah. Which you just launched. Just launched on, on Monday, yeah. So Why should Connell O'Morine buy a little runabout like that? Because you're a man of style and taste. <laughs> <laughs> I did look at the colours. I look at anything to do with the cars. I just love, I saw a rose gold. Yeah. It's very me, I thought. Yeah, yeah, no, it would suit you. The, 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 we can give it to you in Cabrio. I have one in the showroom ready to go. No problem at all. Yeah, the Fiat 500, um, it, it's an amazing car. There's a few cars in history that that that, that just have that iconic status. The Volkswagen Beetle, of course, um, the Fiat 500, um, even the Audi TT in, in design terms. They were standout no, cars in their day. Uh, the Fiat 500 um, was reinvented just over 14 years ago. Again, you know, safety systems had to change. So you couldn't keep the same body shell, the same technology. So, you know, in order to make motoring much more um, uh, fit for purpose for the modern era, the car was reinvented about 14 years ago. And it's one of the few cars, car models in history that has maintained uh, uh, in in the main an upward sales trajectory over its lifespan. Its lifespan of 14 years in its current iteration is quite phenomenal. Most cars last, model cars last about five to seven years at a stretch. And what is it about, it's a beautiful dinky little thing, but what is it about that that gives it that longevity? Again, it's it's style, it's representation, it's 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 pop culture position, you know, in, in movies, it's it's the south of France, it's Audrey <laughs> Hepburn in, in its origins, you know. So again, it's something that's very difficult to quantify other than everybody recognises it as an iconic vehicle. Now, you are the super salesman. I mean, people in the industry will identify with that and recognise you as such. How are you going to position your Honda, your Fiat, your Alfa Romeo, your Jeep against each other? Because that's a further complication to your problems is that you have to outdo yeah. your own brands. And, 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 and more than that, on the other side of our house, we have, of course, we have Peugeot, Citroën, Opel, DS as well, all vying for market share. Oh, before I forget it. Opel, are yeah. they ever? We'll never win the World Cup again. Do you remember we won the World yeah, Cup yeah, in 1990? Yeah, 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 that yeah. was only because we had Opel on the thing. It's like, we'll never win uh, the Eurovision without Johnny Logan. Yeah, 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 so are sure. you guys ever going to sponsor the football team again? Well, believe it or not, we signed the biggest uh, 
car sponsorship deal in Ireland last year when we become the, became the official car partner of uh, the Irish rugby team. So the IRFU yeah, actually yeah, in total. Yeah, no, I'm, but I'm are we going to get on the I on the jersey win the again? World Cup for soccer. <laughs> <laughs> We have to fight. We fight. You find the next Jack Charlton and we'll see what we can do, Carl, for sure. Okay. Sorry, now I interrupted you there. Yep. You have this extremely broad uh, range of cars of yep. different brands, yep. marks as they would be correctly called. Sure. Is, how do you position them against each other? Who says? Does it come from your the Gowan board group or, uh, or does it come from abroad? Who tells you this is premium, this is super premium, this is, I don't know what other terms you use. Yeah, sure. So again, the, the, we're, we're slightly different in that Honda sits outside the Stellantis portfolio. So that's, that's an independent motor manufacturer. Um, and we've been representing those for about 37 years at this point. Uh, so they have a very defined strategy in Europe, uh, at the moment as they transition again from, from traditional, uh, ICE vehicles into new low emitting vehicles. The Stellantis suite of products, you're absolutely right. It's a huge challenge, um, whereby you put a, a number of those brands side by side uh, on a forecourt and how do you position them? And, and that is the, the, the crux of the challenge. Um, it's globally, Stellantis will say you can leverage a lot of training, you can leverage a lot of back house and all that sort of stuff. So the, the business model becomes efficient at that point when you can have one part system, you can have uh, one training system, one uh, dealer management system per se. But the really interesting piece is out front because you want impassioned people. You want people who want to drive that vehicle, who want to sell that vehicle, uh, and who can identify that in, in customers. And there should be a really healthy battle uh, in the front end uh, between sales representatives and, and brand representatives to, to, to fight for their product in the, in the open market. And that's what's really exciting. Is there a different margin, uh, net margin I'm talking about, between the various brands? You know, is it worth your while more to sell a Jeep over an Alfa Romeo? It, it, margin, <laughs> margin, yeah, it's uh, it's number one on the list. Okay, so it's, it's incredibly difficult because what happens is as, as vehicles, as vehicles cycle through their product life cycle, uh, they're on an upswing, they plateau, they start to tail off and your margin structure reflects that really. Um, and you might you might be making provisions in the early part of the life because you know as, as cars are petering out that you might have to support them more. So there's no such thing as a standard margin across the industry. Great answer. Uh, so yeah. I can't work out how much of a discount I can get. Uh, no, dis- <laughs> discount, I don't understand you, Conrad. Right? <laughs> you have to, to my, write that down. Back to my question again. On the forecourt, I walk up and I see an Alpha, and I see a Fiat, and I see a Jeep, and I may have a preference one, a little over one over the other. Mm. How are you selling me one over the other? Is it because I'm tall, dark, and handsome, or...? Do you know, I, I think subliminally, you know the answer before you arrive with us. I do. So what certainly, do you think I'd buy? What do you... Th- <laughs> Okay, so um, it's a it's a dangerous one because the stage one in sales pre qualification and all these sales training uh, pieces that we're all involved in is pre qualifying your customer, and you can't pre qualify your customer without a list of questions. And it starts with the utilitarian stuff. Do you have children? How how often do you drive? Do you commute? Where do you park? All of these various different bits and pieces. You get through all the practical bits, and throughout that process, you uncover. The stories. My father had a Fiat 127. I remember traveling to Trilly. 131? 131 Merifiori. I remember them well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In gorgeous orange. Yeah, not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for sure. So as I say, you know, we get the practical bit right. That's kind of easy. And through that process, you'll uncover the passion. And people just, whether it's passion or whether it's just uh, the optics of, I really like that car. And most of them come to our, our outlets and they say, I saw such and such a car in a car park or on the road or and mm. do you sell that, you know? Mm. So that's where our marketing or advertising is based is to try and ignite that little bit of passion. You'll see the glossy ads. They're not there by mistake. They're, they're there to provoke passion. They're there to trap people like me. Provoke passion. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to actually turn the table on you there because mm. one of the problems, you have an ugly suite on the range and you know what I'm going to talk about. It's mm. the Jeep. The Jeep mm. is an ugly looking car. Somebody mm. forgot to tell the designers to come in that day. <laughs> and I don't know how you're going to get out of this one. Yeah. But how do you sell an ugly suite? How do you sell an ugly suite? Okay. <laughs> uh, so um, I suppose within your question really is the answer again. It's not for you. 
because beauty <laughs> is in anybody. the it's, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So when I talked earlier about brand characteristics and brand personalities, Fiat, you know, if if you were to if you were to epitomize it, it's Audrey Hepburn on the Amalfi Coast the, with the roof down and and the scarf blowing. If you look at the Jeep brand, it it really is embedded in that Willys Jeep from World War Two. It has a four wheel drive system that will crawl up the walls. Uh, it's all about utilitarian pieces uh, and it's very American and that American stylizing, you know, is is jarring to some people here in Europe, but less so. Um, where Jeep will really get a foothold now um, is because of their their, their really um, impressive four-wheel drive system. As most other marks are leaving the four-wheel drive arena because they can't marry that technology Um People who need utilitarian vehicles for towing boats, horse okay. boxes, garden uh, trailers, that sort of thing, they're, they're running out of options. And again, they got to go across a muddy field and there's nothing better than a mud plugger than a Jeep. Many of the old, uh, in fact, you have a background of, uh, when, 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 before you joined Gowan, of selling in uh, garages with the old fashioned mm. garage. Many of those garages are now disappearing and we've become very Americanized here with the uh, the, Big the, glass palaces. Yeah, out, mm. out, but off like the M50 or off mm. the M4 or off the mm. something. What's the future of selling cars? Will I be clicking on a screen? Because already when I do look at cars, of which I do a lot, mm. I can build my fanciest uh, model ever, never having to talk to a salesman yeah. or saleswoman either. Yeah, again, the the industry is, is working very hard to uh, to realign itself with new consumer behaviours. So, uh, in that instance, in the in the traditional retail model, I suppose the challenge we have is the internet. It's our best friend and our worst enemy. Um, if I go back to my last last time I hosted sales training, I was talking to guys about your average showroom visit per sale was somewhere around four or five. That's down to one. So. Again, people used to go in four or five times, times, kind of kick the tires, yeah, ask the questions, the doors. collect another brochure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, and that was a defined part of the sales process. Again, part of your pre qualification. And, and now they walk in and say, I want the one in rose gold. It's about one and a half. Yeah. And in a lot of instances, particularly with new technology, most of our customers are incredibly well read um, yeah. because the te- technology, the information is at your fingertips. So, yeah. It's fantastic, but we must embrace that. We can't force traditional retail there's, models there's in that environment. There's also a problem for you, is there not, in terms of uh, visibility of the pricing? Because I can see that it's a different price here. Well, obviously the UK, mm. God damn it, because they just get their nicer cars at cheaper. But across Europe, I can see the pricing anywhere, can't I? Yeah, absolutely. But but unfortunately, pricing is actually harmonised across Europe in the main. You know, again, you'll have local promotions and, and timely promotions, campaign promotions around reg periods. But also Ultimately, cars are the same price across Europe. The difficulty we have here in Ireland is our taxation system. We have a very onerous uh, VRT system, which can add anything up to 41% additional tax on top of VAT yeah. onto a vehicle at the high end. So that's really where it, uh, it gets skewed heavily. So yeah, so visibility pricing is not an issue with us. Um, you know, you'll see a lot around pricing, you'll see a lot of um, uh, generic national ads with dealer and delivery charges uh, um, not included, and that's that allows your local dealer provide a service level. So he might say one dealer might include a delivery package, mud flaps and tow bar, and that will be priced into the vehicle. Uh, another dealer might just say, well, we literally wash it, put the plates on, give you a good handover, but we don't add in any other value proposition. Why do they still charge? I don't know. Is it three hundred euro or something? It's up to me. Aggravating, just silly. It's just a little niggle. Yeah, it is a niggle, and and unfortunately, uh, so a we 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 it wouldn't be right for us to set pricing per se. Um, we can give you recommended retail pricing. We have to allow a dealer represent his own uh, business model and recoup his costs. But also, if we include it in the retail price, that that additional cost is subject to VRT because VRT is based on the open market selling of uh, price of that vehicle. So if we put it on, we've got to pay tax on it. Sorry, customer has to pay tax on it. Yeah. So we're trying as an industry to extract as much of the real costs that shouldn't be subject to taxation. We've also lobbied hard as an industry for the last number of years to exclude safety systems from VRT. So if your car came in with additional safety systems, LIDAR, radar, and all that sort of stuff, it's, 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 it's not right that a customer should have to pay VRT on that element, that option, as it were, you know. So yeah, it's just another... My heart is bleeding here. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah, the guys at Gowan asked me to ask you that in a year's time, uh, what will you uh, expect as being your, if you've been successful? In other words, when you go for your review, <laughs> what? Because again, I do see, that I, I'm kind of, my head is a little bit fuddled by this, is that you've got these brands and you've got to make them all work. Yeah. Because if you prefer one over the other, and I don't know which ones I prefer, sure. so I'd be promoting those. Sure. You'd be given out to. Yeah. That wouldn't be nice. It's it's the real interview question, isn't it? What does success look like? Yeah. You know, so what does success look like, I suppose, for our division? Um, yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting year. So we're very lucky. We have really, really strong brands. We have phenomenal brand recognition. 2023, uh, Fiat will celebrate 100 years in Ireland. That's great. And everybody fantastic. I speak to sp- speaks about, you know, some level of Fiat in, in their life, in their family and so on and so forth. So, the easy bit is done in that sense. We've we've got to turn that into a viable business. We've an obligation to our dealer network, which is small at the moment. It will expand. We've got to get production through. Production is a massive problem at the moment. Um, and we've got to build more current awareness around our product offering. And again, as I as I said to my team recently, we've 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 inherited these brands now on the crest of a slump. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we're 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 facing the stars. The only way is it, up. the only way is up, uh, and we are we are unleashing unleashing uh, a fabulous raft of new product, really exciting product, and our job is to engage the customer. So is everybody else. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I there are a lot of maybe uh, new kids on the block. Okay, maybe brands with without that level of heritage, yeah. with fairly bland and vanilla versions of that technology. But what what Fiat, Alfa Romeo, and Jeep are bringing to the marketplace in terms of this transition piece is hugely exciting. Two final questions. One is, John Saunders, who would you hire in a heartbeat? Mm, okay. The indulgent answer is one of my sporting heroes, but that, that would be that Well, would go be on, you're fair. allowed. Go on, who, who would that be? Well, it, it'd have to be Senna. You know, I think okay. a guy who, uh, who, who could exist in, in a very competitive world. Uh, uh, and he came to it okay through, through kart racing, but he, he took on the system and he was just a raw talent. And he was, yeah. he, he was everything that epitomized sport. He was a gentleman on top of it all and, uh, and a general good guy. So that would be an indulgent hire. Um, if I was to be quite cold and business about it, you have to look at some of our industry visionaries. In fairness, actually, the, the CEO of Stellantis at the moment is a guy called Carlos Taveras. And he has a phenomenal vision. You're Dr- not going to Dr- choose Dr- the boss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is. I'm sad. actually going to choose the boss because the boss I'm going to choose. If I was, if I was being absolutely honest, uh, and this is a real uh, uh, nod. I'd hire my wife because okay. she's far better at everything I do. Well, you better give she's her a proper working. name, a full name. So that that'll be my wife, Brenda. Uh, and does Brenda have a surname? Brenda or Saunders. Saunders. No, Saunders. Saunders. she's Saunders. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, Brenda, you're you're hired, but you probably know that anyway. <laughs> she's going to be back at home. Oh, Jeez, what's yeah, she yeah, doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the second question I have for you is that you know that the show is sponsored by De Facto Shaving Solution. Mm. And what have you got on your face? Mm. You know that Tom Murphy, the boss, is going to be so unhappy because what are the chances that you're going to use his gorgeous product? Well, thankfully, uh, this is this is uh, radio, audio, not visual. <laughs> so, uh, in the old "Only Fools and Horses" joke, who put that man's head on upside down? So, <laughs> I've plenty oh, of beard awesome. and and not too much on top. So, uh, because as always, the great business stories that you've just heard from John Saunders and others there are brought to you by De Facto, which is, as John knows, it's like his brands. It's the world's greatest all natural shaving oil. Get it at defactoshave.com. John Saunders. Thanks for joining us on that great business show, even. Super. Thank you very much, Connell. Thinking of travel? If so, make sure to make De Facto, the world's best shaving oil, your choice of travel companion. A 25 milliliter bottle of De Facto means no hassle at airports, no bulky cans to carry, and the guarantee of the world's best shave. DeFactoShave.com. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. 
Now that COVID looks like it's finally on the wane, we will look back on many weird things we did during lockdowns, like queuing for toilet paper and fist bumping each other like demented American football players. And I'm glad to see the back of both of those. Another one which was a bit weird was the palpable anger generated by sea swimmers who chose to wear a product called dry robes. I say by them, but it was actually against them. Sea swimming kept thousands of people sane and dry robes kept those same thousands of people alive when they came out of Ireland's freezing seawater. So I never really got what all the fuss was all about. But all of the fuss was great news for one Irish brand, Orca Boards, an Irish brand that designs its products, including paddle boards, changing robes, and most recently swimwear right here in Ireland. Orca Board was one of the winners of the Arnott's competition, featured by us a couple of times here on That Great Business Show that allowed them to sell their products in that iconic store. Kevin Darcy is co-founder of Orca Boards and joins me now on That Great Business Show. Kevin, you're welcome. Thanks, Connell. Amazing to be here. Kevin, tell us the backstory. <laughs> I've just been laughing. What do you really do? Um, I suppose to answer that, I'm an accountant by trade. Um, and have An been auditor. An auditor, yeah. If you listen to that great business show, I sigh when I hear all this. <laughs> <laughs> do your pals all go, oh God, here comes Kevin again, he's an auditor. <laughs> I, I try not to. To mention auditing um, a lot when I'm out with friends. Um, but to be fair to you, you have done well because you and your recently, not quite betrothed, but recently engaged partner is uh, that you have now set up this business on the side, I suppose. And it's looking very, very healthy. Yeah. Um, Alana is um, probably the founder and definitely the co-owner of the business and I suppose it was a, just over 12 months ago we, we started a company called Orca Board. And why is an auditor setting up a business which is quite sexy, really? I mean, it's uh, paddle <laughs> boards and uh, swimwear and uh, stuff like that. Um, I suppose for us, we started paddle boarding about 10 years ago. Um, we were in Spain together and um, we saw these giant surfboard looking objects on the beach and we said we have to give that a try so we went out on them and we were immediately hooked there's something about being either in or on the ocean that's quite calming I so agree I mean honestly it is if you haven't done it you're mad because you should it's something that I don't know something in us in our DNA yeah, you should I be sitting so, in the water yeah, yeah exactly not yeah. too much effort just easy <laughs> <laughs> um, but then Coming home to Ireland after that holiday, it was a bit impractical to own a 13 foot um, solid kind of paddleboard. Um, where would we store it? How would we transport it? And so that dream kind of faded out for a few years until around about five years ago when the inflatable paddle mo- paddleboard market started to uh, to take off or to um, inflate, I suppose. Oh, oh. I know that you're making jokes. <laughs> I know you've heard it here first. <laughs> um, apologies for that. <laughs> <laughs> we love a good pun. <laughs> so um, it was at that point, it was actually realistic for us to own our own boards uh, and to go out on the weekends and be able to store them and transport them and all those issues that come with, um, or yeah, that come with holding a 13 foot board versus something that wraps up into a backpack. So... It was probably two years ago now um, when COVID really started to hit Ireland and the country looked like it was locking down and we went to upgrade our equipment. And we realised that the price of the paddleboards has increased dramatically. The quality has stayed the same, if not decreased. And we thought, you know, this is going to be a huge hindrance to people getting involved in the sport and getting out in the ocean. So we decided to design our own boards, taking the features we love from all the different boards we'd seen over the past 10 years and combine them into one Orca board. So you did actually do a bit of designing because I was uh, a wee bit sceptical. I thought, you know, designed in Ireland, oh yeah, yeah, you ring up China and say, would you ever ship us over a few (laughs) Orca boards? But no, you actually did a bit of designing. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, There's a lot of technical specifications that go into designing a board. What length do you want? What width? What thickness? Um, what kind of EVA pad do you want on the surface? What features do you want? So one unique feature is they can be converted into a kayak through the use of um, extra D-rings on the surface of the board. So 
kind of get oh very technical yeah <laughs> but one of the things that I was looking at your website on it's actually very affordable Four yeah, nine, four yeah nine it's nine? 499 so um, that's not a bad entry price to zip down onto the ocean and you're there no yeah. motor no nothing just a little bit of paddle uh, yeah exactly um, and that was one of our key kind of points that we wanted to achieve when we were designing the board which is how are we going to make it a price that's affordable because if you look at the UK market for a red paddleboard, you're looking at double. Why? Um, marketing. Really? Yeah. Simple as. Simple and as yet, marketing. You, as an auditor, hasn't seen the benefits of margin, and you could have a dirty, great big margin just by copying the UK. Um, you could, but I think ethically, you want to create a great product and sell that at a price that's fair for both the consumer and the company. And that is what will gain lasting business. Okay, that seems like fair enough. And I'm beginning to like this already. <laughs> so let's move on to the lovely robes, your Orca, Orca board robes, because we'll get on to the whole Orca name in a minute. Is why, like, was it just me or did, like I was reading the newspapers, people hitting other people because they were wearing <laughs> another brand. Maybe they, maybe it was you hitting them because they were <laughs> wearing another brand. Um, like they are so bloody practical. They, people, they are, yeah. You get out of your car or whatever, walk down into the water, walk out, put it on into the car again because it's all waterproof. Exactly. And it's a great way to actually change at the beach and not expose yourself to everyone down at the 40 foot or down at yeah. a, a FICO Bats. So it's a really practical piece of equipment um, that came to popularity mainly during the pandemic again when people took to, to the sea. So what was the aggro about? I think the notices that went up in around Unleary for the dry robe types, I think people might have felt that they owned the sea uh, around that area and probably didn't like the influx of people that discovered it during... Um, their 5k restriction or their their county restriction so I think the increase in traffic and things like that it just annoyed people and it was a bloody godsend to you guys was um, it? I wouldn't say a godsend I think um, the pandemic was difficult for everyone but there was a lot of benefits I think that everyone discovered during that and that's yeah. getting back to nature and getting back to either hiking or, or sea swimming and everything like that so um, every, every, every cloud has a, has a silver lining, <laughs> yeah. I would say. So did sales go through the roof and could you source supply and all? Because again, they're not manufactured in Ireland, but you are, you can personalise them and all that. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So um, we have a commercial um, embroidery machine, which we, we operate ourselves to put names, initials. The pair of you? Uh, yeah. You work pretty hard, don't you? Um, <laughs> I mean... There was a time there where there was nothing else to do. So, um, <laughs> no, no, you're meant to be working, and I won't name the company, but you're meant to be working for that company. Were you embroidering on their time? Of course not. No, um, <laughs> it goes back to the ethics and everything that we, how we operate and where we operate. Um, but the product that we designed is is called Blubber, um, and we thought Blubber was a good name because. No, but that's different to your. Uh, robe, isn't it? No, the robe is... Is that a blubber? Yeah, it's blubber, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. And the reason um, we thought blubber was a good name is because blubber keeps whales and dolphins warm in the water. So we yeah. thought blubber keeps you warm. Yeah, um, but you know what else blubber is? <laughs> <laughs> There's, it's what everybody doesn't want to have. <laughs> but everyone has. Okay. So, you know, embrace it. It is a lovely name. Yeah. Tell us about the uh, your problems with trademarks and names because it doesn't matter if you go on to a website like Black Knight where I would go and look at um, uh, uh, domain names. Uh, there's somebody or some mm. persons worldwide who've just taken every word in the English language, mixed them up and you cannot buy a dot right. whatever yeah. for love nor money. So I think if you go on to any word in the dictionary and type .com after it, you'll find that it's been owned it's by GoDaddy or one of those US companies who just routinely snaps up domains. So we needed, um, I suppose going back to the different brands we operate, we have Orca Board for our paddle boards, Blubber for everything that keeps you warm, changing robes and wetsuits coming shortly and then Beluga for our swimwear. We tried to have different brand names for the reason that 
Cadbury have 50 different types of bars on the market. It, it, it's diversification of risk. So if there's ever a problem with one bar, they can just pull that bar and, you know, they have 49 other bars that you can choose from in the store. You won't even know you're buying a Cadbury bar. Um, and that's probably the reason. Um, and then it was easier to get with our spelling of the likes of Beluga um, to get the trademarks that we needed over things like that. Um, because you used double O or triple O or something yeah, like that, du- didn't you? Yeah, double O. Double we spelled o. it just a little bit um, different to the whales, um, which, which is you, yeah. And then Blubber as well. I, I was actually quite surprised there wasn't a trademark over Blubber. Um, and so we were able to get you know, European trademarks across all of our range. So this sounds like a growing business for you, even though it is a side hustle at the moment. Which takes precedence? Where is, where is it going to go? Um, side hustle is a loose term, I would say. I'm employed to work uh, seven hours a day and the other 17 hours, I would say, are kind of either focused on this or um, or dreaming about this. <laughs> so, um, oh, Where did that motivation come from? Um, As in, was there, was there uh, entrepreneurship in the family or? No, no. Um, no. And there's, it's still only ourselves. We own um, all of the company and yeah. I suppose. And then she's marrying into the company. <laughs> no, no. I, I think I'm marrying into her company. Um, but if I think about what drove it, I suppose w- w- I suppose we always wanted to have a business to combine that with your passion. We're very lucky to be able to do that. And then we're even more lucky to be able to work with the likes of Arnott's or 53 Degrees North in order to actually um, to sell this product and to try build a brand um, in Ireland. How did the Arnott's experiment go? Brilliant. Um, they told me, I think that they have a million visitors between November and Chris, the end of Christmas or the end of November, uh, December. Yeah. I, That's I, a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Um, and you can really see that when you, if you walk into that store in December, it's crammed with people, um, which is fantastic because retail, I think, has suffered over the last while. And it's great to see people back um, in the stores and on the streets. But... The one thing, or sorry, the main thing it gave us was an ability to speak to customers in front of you, looking at your product and then telling you what else they want to see from you. Yeah, um, I mean, it's so important, isn't it? That is key. Yeah. So every day we were there, it was like a market research project yeah. where you have people coming up, browsing, trying on, discussing and um, thankfully buying. Um, and then and to be able what, to, what did you learn? Some little insides. <laughs> um, Are you I going to go to give a bigger range, a larger range, a taller yeah, range? Or what? Yeah, definitely. Um, the range is expanding. I mentioned wetsuits a minute ago. That's something that people wanted from us. Um, and what's going to be different about them? Same as all of our other products. We'll look at what's out there and we'll try make it better at a more affordable price. Which you haven't designed it yet. We have, yeah. Um, when will it hit the shops? It'll be here for the summer. Um, it took a lot of trial and error on something like a wetsuit, the type of seam to use, um, the type of material to use. I love it. Whether you can use a recyclable material on a wetsuit and how would you do that, how long would it last, and, and that kind of... Because again, your swimwear is recyclable and has been used from previously recycled product, isn't that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it uses a material called Reprieve, which is um, a US material from... Um, a, a really great company who collects plastic bottles and breaks them back down into pellets, takes those pellets, turns them into um, yarn and then can make clothes out of that. So it's a really innovative um, material. And who's the brains behind the operation? And I'll tell you why I'm asking this <laughs> is one of your products, we're all familiar with the Christmas jumper. You have Christmas swimming togs. I thought that was really clever. <laughs> Well, one of the things that Ireland does on Christmas Day f- is they go swimming. We, yeah. we, we jump into the freezing cold water. Be careful with this um, word, we. <laughs> I love water, love swimming. We'll not go into the Irish water. It's too dot, 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 freezing. But anyway, that's, only, that's only me. But who came up with the idea of the uh, brilliant idea, great idea? Um, I suppose we wanted something in Arnott's at Christmas that was a little bit different. Yeah, And so we said... Christmas jumpers are a huge yeah. thing in Ireland. They they took off um, many years ago now and there's so many different iterations of them. What else do people do at Christmas? They go swimming. Yeah, and, that's um, a lovely idea. You still haven't told me who came up. Was it you or Alana? <laughs> um, 
Uh, or did hard. you see it somewhere else? Maybe you nicked it as an no, idea? No, I would say, no, that was 100% unique. I can't think of... I'd love if you were able to trademark or keep that to yourselves. I think just, it's clever. Just yeah. a lovely, simple idea. Yeah, and yeah, trademarking is, is definitely one of the things we upskilled in. Um, I think two of our robes on the, in the Blubber range, they're kind of titanium is the name. They're kind of shiny and we were able to get Irish trademarks on them, which is, again, important for protecting something that you design from scratch and you come up with. And so that's really important. So instead of watching TV or watching <laughs> spreadsheets, do you two sit down and look at design all day, every day, or sit on the couch holding hands looking at designs? <laughs> um, no, thankfully. <laughs> um, I suppose you have to... A really important thing when we're designing anything is we want to design for everyone. And this was really important to Alana when we were doing the swimwear, that she designed a swimsuit that could be worn by every woman and... Um, and that every woman could feel comfortable in it. And that all comes down then to things like the hip line, where do you draw that, and the arms. And there's no other company making swimwear out there for the Irish Sea. I'll tell you that, you know, it's it's bikinis or it's, you know, interesting looking one pieces and things like that. So to have kind of long sleeve, um, you know, a, a flattering cut on oh, the hip. The, the uh, swimwear has long sleeve. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I wear those myself. And, and then, <laughs> and then a zip down the middle. So they're okay. they're a really flattering design um, yeah. that we kind of came up with. And has a bit of a collar as well. So kind of it, it looks it looks well. I love the idea of this young lad auditor <laughs> who's talking to me about a hip line <laughs> and about where it cuts. <laughs> and, right. I say this is incredibly important to Alana because these are issues obviously that women have faced when they buy swimwear. Um, I think as a as a guy, we probably go in and grab a pair of shorts and, and that's it. Yeah. Um, but it was great to be able to do that and the feedback was fantastic. And the fact we went up to either a double or a triple XL as well made it very inclusive for, for all women to, to be able to wear this. What's the future? Um, good question. I suppose when I look at where we are now and where we want to be, um, I look at Enterprise Ireland's website and I see they call it a high potential startup, something that can get a million in revenue after three years and 10 employees. Um, we did just under 300,000 last year, um, which is our first year. So we're That's really so happy bad. with that. Oh, yeah. Um, we'll have a full year in Arnott's this year. So we're hoping for growth. We're hoping to kind of get to around about half a million next year. Um and hopefully hit that one million then after the three years. That's the okay. target at the moment. Fantastic. Love it. Great story. That's even better. I'd read about you and obviously been in contact with you. But it's even better now that I know the hit line. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> Very important. So congratulations to both you and Alana. You better give Alana her surname. Her uh, Pryor. Yeah. Alana Pryor. Okay. Congratulations to Alana Pryor and to Kevin Darcy. But you still have another question to uh, answer. Higher in a heartbeat, who would... Kevin, higher in a heartbeat. This was the most difficult question that I thought I was going to be faced with and took a lot of thought. Um, I was thinking of going down the, the kind of humorous answer with someone like Matt Damon, who did a lot, obviously, for the swim community yeah. uh, during lockdown. But I actually went with um, Niall Horgan at the end of it, um, who is one of the co-founders and I think CEO of Jim and Coffee. Oh, we have. Yeah, we have had Jim and Coffee on, on a previous radio show, but we've also had them on here, right? I think I remember we're at episode 72 and if you multiply that out by three or four <laughs> companies per podcast we're up at way over a couple of hundred now so it's going well so will you come back in again to us next year and uh, tell us about <laughs> the new range I presume this you're forever thinking of new product are you? Yeah exactly yeah um, we're thinking about you know summer in our head summer has, has gone and you're thinking about next winter already and, yeah. and then when summer comes you're thinking about winter and next summer already and um, you kind of have to plan that far ahead. And you um, better give a shout out for your um, website. As I mentioned, our products are available either in Arnott's or 53 Degrees North and also online at orcaboard.ie. Orca, as in orca the whale, board.ie. And that is it, unfortunately, for now from That Great Business Show, episode 72. So please, please, please share, like, retweet this podcast with all of your connections on social media. And when you do, you look smart and we look happy. And do it now before you forget. 
It's just the click button away from you, but it means commercial success for us. Also, do subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast platform, and that makes sure that Ireland's best business podcast is always to hand. And my thanks to the team here, as usual, at the Dublin Podcast Studios, including today's sound engineer. He's a newbie. He's Mark McCarthy. So thank you very much to Mark. And then Peter Rice, who takes over every week to make sure we are the world's best sounding podcast. And we are here to help businesses just like yours. So if there are issues or topics you would like us to cover, contact us using our favorite LinkedIn page, where we have lots of chats with businesses and business owners and if you're planning an ad campaign we would love to help join companies like big red cloud and virgin media as well as organizations like ismi and uderos Nagurtote, who recognize it's the great way to talk to ireland's smes and as always the great business show and their insights on are brought to you by that great maker of shaving oil de facto shave made in mayo sold worldwide but they won't be selling it very much of it to kevin darcy because for the second person on this podcast he's got a beard boo to beard <laughs> That's what we say, but I'm sure he'll uh, find some use for it. Maybe you, you shave your legs for your <laughs> adult boarding or something, no? Um, I don't. No, okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry, Tom Murphy, Tom Murphy owner. Anyway, it is sold worldwide, and our thanks to them. And so from me, Conal O'Moran, Mavuichas, Huev, Erfad, August, Slan, Tamil.